I would love to flex on all of my friends that I have one of, na of, of 32 BMW M540i's ever made. Hi everyone, I'm Kenan from Cars and Vids and today's video is going to be a little bit different. You see, when this BMW E34 M540i showed up at Cars and Vids headquarters, naturally I wanted to do a video about it. But then it got me thinking. I really wasn't that familiar with this car and there are several other BMW models that are pretty obscure. And so in today's video, I wanted to talk about five different BMW models that you may have forgotten about or didn't know that much about, including this one. And with that, let's get nerdy. The first car I want to talk about would be the BMW E46 M3 GTR Strasse version. Very short and simple name, but this is a very special car. A lot of people are familiar with the BMW E46 M3 GTR. That was the version of the M3 that BMW took racing. But not a lot of people realize that in order to take part in that race series, BMW had to build 10 road cars. And that's exactly what they did with the Strasse version or street version. Powering that car would be the P60B40 4 liter naturally aspirated V8. Now that engine wasn't used in any normal road cars and that was the main reason why BMW had to build these road going versions in order to use that engine when they went racing. It made 350 horsepower and 269 foot pounds of torque. The racing versions were all equipped with a sequential manual gearbox, but for the road going cars, they got six speed manuals. And the result is that that car could do 183.3 miles per hour, whereas the standard E46 M3 was limited to 155. In addition to the engine, the car would get a lot of aerodynamic upgrades. The bumpers would be changed, the hood would be different, and the car would gain a gigantic rear wing. Love it or hate it, this body kit is very special, and again, it was important for homologating this car. The M3 GTR Strasse version also went on a diet. It weighed around 400 pounds less than the standard E46 M3, bringing the weight to 2,976 pounds. Again, very critical as this car was going to be the ultra high performance, ultra limited version of the M3. So low curb weight was a huge focus for the M division. Although BMW M was very imaginative when it came to the aerodynamic design for the Strasse version, well, they weren't so creative when it came to color choices. You could only get the car in one combination, titanium silver with a black interior. And if you wanted the privilege of driving an M3 Strasse version, well, you had to pony up 250 thousand euros. But sales really weren't the focus of that car. The whole purpose was to get the M3 GTR homologated for racing, and it did just that. In 2001, of the 10 races the car was entered in, it would win or come in third place in seven of them. But then the rules would change. Instead of just having 10 cars for homologation purposes in 2002, you had to build 100, making the E46 M3 GTR no longer eligible for racing. BMW claimed that that's because the car was simply too dominant and other people didn't want to compete with the mighty E46 M3 GTR. Regardless of the reason, it gave us one of the coolest and most unique homologation cars of the modern era. On the topic of M3s, it brings me to my next car, which is the BMW E90 M3 CRT, which stands for Carbon Racing Technology. This car was designed to showcase BMW's newly found prowess with CFRP or carbon fiber reinforced plastics. All the stuff they had learned while making the BMW i3, the BMW i8, and cars like that. These cars were hand assembled by BMW M GmbH in Garching, Germany between August and October of 2011. They would build 62 left hand drive versions, five right hand drive versions, and one pre-production car dubbed 00. They would also make, obviously, lots of components out of carbon fiber. Most notably, the hood was made completely of carbon, as was the front splitter and some other components up front. They also made the trunk lid completely out of carbon fiber, and on the inside of the car, they made the front seats out of carbon fiber. They gave it these really cool looking racing seats. All M3 CRTs are finished the exact same way. They're painted frozen polar silver on the outside, and they have these unusual Melbourne red accents, most notably on the hood where they outline the air vents, on the side where they outline those air vents, and then at various places throughout the rest of the body, some on the front lip spoiler and some on the trunk spoiler. Kind of unusual as the Melbourne red really stands out, but it's an easy way to identify a CRT from the outside. 
On the inside, BMW give these seats black and secure orange trim, which again, stands out. And in the back of the car, they would give it individual seats, not one normal bench seat like they would do in the standard E90 M3. Additionally, all of these cars are individually numbered, as identified by a plaque located on the dashboard that tells you exactly which number your car is out of the entire series. But the changes to the car weren't just skin deep. BMW would also use the same powertrain out of the M3 GTS. Instead of the normal M3's V8, that car would have a 4.4 liter naturally aspirated V8 courtesy of a longer stroke. And the result is that it would make 444 horsepower and 324 foot-pounds of torque. Sadly, on the M3 CRT, the only transmission you could get was the DCT. No six-speed manual available for that car. But even so, the focus of the CRT was less on track performance as it was with the GTS. It was more focused on on-road performance and again, showing off what BMW could do with carbon fiber. The result of all of this is that the car weighs 99 pounds less than the equivalent road-going M3. However, there is some debate about that. According to BMW, that because they put all of the factory equipment they could into the CRT, if they had built it as a stripper spec and you compare that to a normal stripper spec E90, it would weigh 150 pounds less than the standard car. Quite a lot of weight saving. Regardless, it's not that important today. What's important is how rare this car is. And when they come up for sale, they command quite a premium. Staying in the Bangle era, there's another lightweight BMW that I want to talk about, and that is the BMW E60 M5 CSL. Just like the M3, BMW would apply their lightweight technology to this car using lots of carbon fiber, most notably with the roof, which was one carbon fiber panel, and they would use it on a lot of the induction components for that car. They would also add carbon fiber racing seats to that car. And the result is that the E60 M5 CSL weighed 110 pounds less than the SMG equipped E60 M5. But they didn't stop there. BMW would also play a lot with the engine. As I mentioned, they would change the induction for that car, but they would also make it larger. They would take it from a 5 liter V10 to a 5.4 liter V10 and power reportedly rose from 500 horsepower to 621 naturally aspirated horsepower, according to BMW M. A wild figure. But again, they weren't done just yet. They would also revise the aerodynamics of the car. Most notably, there's an intake that was added to the front bumper, and they would add a DCT transmission to the car, removing the SMG transmission and putting a dual clutch in its place. The result is that the E60 M5 CSL reportedly got around the Nürburgring 20 seconds a lap faster than the standard E60 M5, which is impressive because well, the E60 M5 was no slouch already. BMW would also give this car a very distinctive livery. They would paint the car white and then kind of put M stripes everywhere. I think the idea was they wanted it to look like the ring taxi of the time so that when it was out testing, people wouldn't be so wise to the M5 CSL was out on the track. They would just think it was the ring taxi. Regardless, it's a very distinctive look for a very distinctive car. BMW would also make an M6 CSL, but it wasn't as extreme as the M5. For instance, it used a normal S85 V10 that was found in a normal M6, not the hyped up version that was found in the E60 M5 CSL. Even so, that car would incorporate a lot of really cool aerodynamic touches. Most notably, it would get active aero. At the front, there was a spoiler that would deploy at speed to generate more downforce, and at the rear, there was one that would pop out of the rear deck lid to generate even more downforce, because whenever you do something at the front aerodynamically, you have to do something at the rear. Just like the E60, that car was a one-off production car. They would only make one, it would never go into standard production, but elements from that car would make it into later BMWs, most notably the mirror design used for the E63 M6 CSL. That would influence the mirror design that was found on later BMWs, and it looks very similar to the ones we find on M models today. Regardless, these two cars represent some of the cool what-ifs if BMW had put them into production, and they're some of the coolest prototype BMWs ever made. The next car I want to discuss is an unusual one, and that is the BMW Z3 V12. In 1999, for some reason, BMW wanted to prove that they could put any engine in any of their cars, and so they chose the Z3. I think the logic was, well, we have put a six-cylinder in the Z3, why not just double it and put 12 cylinders in there? And that's exactly what they did. 
The BMW has never officially commented on it, but most believe they put the M73 5.4 liter V12 into that car. In normal configuration, it would produce 320 horsepower and 361 foot-pounds of torque. And it meant that the Z3 V12 could get from zero to 60 miles an hour in a claimed 5.5 seconds. It also would go on to a top speed of 163 miles an hour, which was plenty of performance at that time. BMW would also give the car a six-speed manual transmission and the wheels from the M Roadster because, well, with its modifications, it needed some more mechanical stability. However, as awesome as this car was with its V12 engine, weight was an issue that it had. The car weighed 3,086 pounds, which for a car from the late 1990s and for a car of its size, wasn't exactly light. Of course, BMW would never put this car into production. It really was just a pet project to keep themselves entertained. However, it does remain one of the coolest and most unusual one of BMWs in the company's history. And now it's time to talk about the car that lies in front of us, and that is the E34 M540i. When you look at the back of this car, it has an M540i badge on it, and frankly, it looks aftermarket. Most of the time when you would see this, you'd go, what a loser, putting an M badge on a car that doesn't deserve it. Not so in the case of this car, because BMW put it there from the factory. In 1995, to help run out the E34, BMW wanted to do something cool. They wanted to give it a proper send-off, particularly for the US market, and they would give us the 540 M Sport. This was an optional package that you could order on a 540 that would give you some important upgrades that were shared with the E34 M5. You could also have that car with a six-speed manual transmission or an automatic transmission. BMW claims that they produced about 200 of those for the United States. But for the Canadian market, BMW went a little bit even more insane. They created the M540i, not just merely an M Sport, this car was really special. Unlike the US cars, BMW reportedly pulled these off of the standard production line in ding golfing and took them to Garshing to BMW MGMBH headquarters where they were hand assembled. And they gave this car a lot of really special touches. On the outside of this car, BMW would give it a very focused M body kit. Up front, it would get this M inspired front bumper and along the side, it would get these glorious M mirrors just like that found on the E36 M3 and of course also on the E34 M5. This car would also get the glorious Style 37 M parallel wheels, which truly look magnificent on this car. And at the back, as I mentioned, this car would get an M540i badge from the factory. This car would also come with black shadow line exterior trim as standard for the Canadian models as the US models could be optioned with chrome. As usual though, the changes weren't just skin deep with this car as it shared a lot of components with the E34 M5. One of the biggest components it shared would be its braking system. This car has 345 millimeter discs at the front, and critically, they are floating rotors. The benefit of floating rotors is that you have an aluminum center that's then attached to a steel rotor on the outside. Because it's attached to it and not one unit, it moves the steel braking surface out a little bit further, better aligning it with the brakes, giving it even more optimal stopping performance. And they were critical on the E34 M5, and BMW thought that it would be, well, cool to have them here on the M540i. But BMW didn't stop there. They also equipped this car with the Nürburgring and M adaptive suspension found on the E34 M5 in Europe at the time. This is a really cool system in that it had stuff like anti-squat technology, which would stiffen the dampers as needed in order to keep the car from squatting under acceleration. Pretty advanced stuff for the time, and it was wild to see it on this really Really limited production run E34 in Canada. And now we climb under the clamshell hood of the E34 M540i to talk about its biggest difference between this and the M5, and that of course is its engine. In place of the straight six, you have the M60 B40 4 liter naturally aspirated V8. In this form, this car makes 282 horsepower and 295 foot pounds of torque, which compared to the US spec M5 is about 29 less horsepower, but more interestingly, 29 foot pounds of torque more than the M5. So although you don't quite have the horsepower, you do have the low end torque that the M5 did not have. Regardless of the performance figures though, what's fascinating to me is that this car is in effect a V8 E34 M5. 
The next generation, the E39, would obviously receive a V8, and it's wonderful in that car. But this car demonstrated that BMW was ready to experiment with V8 power for its M cars, but they weren't quite ready to commit to an out-and-out -out production version, as this car was made in very limited quantities. Regardless, it's really cool to see a V8 under this hood and experience all the other M5 cool technology that ended up in the M540i. Moving inside the M540i, there are a couple of things I want to note in here as they're very special. One of them would be the carbon fiber trim used on this car. At the time when this car came out, carbon fiber was rare. You really didn't see it in production cars, and you especially didn't see it in things like BMWs. It was normally reserved for Ferraris as it was considered, well, like a space age material. It just was not common, especially for interior trim, but you see it here in this car because it's very special. Even more special than that, though, is the plaque located on the center console. That states that this car is number 9 of 32 produced. 9 of 32 for the Canadian market and 32 for the entire world, making it one of the rarer cars that I've spent time around, to be totally honest. In addition to all these cool touches, BMW would also make sure that this was the ultimate driving machine, and that meant that it had a third pedal and one of these. BMW would give this car a six-speed manual transmission. Now in the United States, you could get the M Sport 540 with either a six-speed or an automatic. Not so for the Canadian market. You could only have this car with a six-speed manual transmission. BMW also gave this car a limited slip differential at the back to give it the best possible powertrain that they could offer it. As I mentioned before, BMW would also give this car adaptive suspension, and it's adjustable here inside of the car. Located to the right of the steering wheel, there's a little switch labeled EDC, which stands for Electronic Damper Control, and it has two positions, P, I don't really know what that stands for, and S, which stands for Sport. I have been dying to drive this car since the second it came in, and now that we've covered all of these facts and figures about the E34 M540i, it's time to flip that switch into Sport and take this thing for a drive. Okay, driving the M540i. This is really cool, and to be totally honest with you, the whole reason I'm doing this video is because I really wanted to drive this car. I've never driven an E34 before, so in usual Canon fashion, I want to start right at the top with this crazy rare, uh, crazy rare car. My initial impressions right away, like the, uh, the steering uh, <laughs> has got some play in it, uh, you know, it was the 90s, that's just how it is. Not a lot of feel on center, and this huge steering wheel in front of me. Yeah, it's definitely of its time. It's, this is not a, an ultra-precise car, but that's kind of... Uh, I'm sure it was good for its era, but now it's just, you know, it's, it's, it certainly stands out immediately when you start driving this thing. It's amazing how quiet this car is. I mean, like, not only, like, the engine, but I'm, like, I'm not hearing traffic outside. <laughs> like, this car is so refined. Um, I'm just like blown away at that. Well, it's still got a nice chassis though. It, it hustles a little bit. You know, very much like the M5s in that it doesn't like to be hustled necessarily. Tight roads aren't. This car is friend. This car likes sweepers. Uh, and that's the same with my E39. It's been the same with every generation M5 I've ever driven. Maybe the E60 is the exception of the E60 likes tighter stuff. Um, that chassis is really sublime. But all the other M5s seem to like, you know, big sweepers. And that's really what they're for, is for barnstorming on the Autobahn. That's, that is what they're happiest doing. And this car, you know, is in that vein, I would say. It's just so usable. And for a car that is approaching its 30th birthday, uh, just like I am, this car was built in the same year that I was born. I think I looked it up and I think this car exactly is like three days older than I am or something like that, which is pretty wild. Like, it still drives really well. You can enjoy this as like almost a daily driver. It's too special to be a daily driver, just the sheer rarity. I would personally be put off driving it every day, but you certainly could. And this one looks so beautiful too. With the M parallel wheels, this is a, just a fabulous looking car. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's it's not it's not a slouch, it's no E36 M3 in terms of how it handles, but um, it's definitely not bad. Oh, and the engine just, yeah, the engine has gobs of torque. It's, it's not as dynamic as like the S62 or even the M62, really. I, I think that it's, it's got plenty of power. Well, the chassis is fun. It's, play, it's playful. And the sizing of this car is amazing. It's so 
narrow uh, that you can just like thread it. You can hit the apexes in your line, in your lane. And this car, real, I mean, when it came out, this was a big, heavy car. But when you're driving it like now, this car feels small and compact, and it just. I know it's a five series and I could fit four people in here, but like goodness, like you can you, <laughs> you can have fun in your own lane. I think that's really the appeal of this car. In addition to the rarity of the M540i, I think the E34 in general is like the sizing, the styling, um, the, the lower curb weight, the feel of the controls, you know, everything just feels like nicely made. Um, and this comes from such a driver centric era of BMW, everything, everything faces the driver, which I think is cool. This is just, a, this is a great modern classic car. It certainly feels a little bit more vintage than the E39, but it has enough E39 touches that make it feel like a, a modern classic. It's, it's very enjoyable. I really, really like this car. The other thing I will say is the E34, in my opinion anyway, is one of the best looking generations of 5 Series. You know, and today, you know, on a beautiful Southern California day, the sun shines splashing across the hood of the E34 M540i in red, driving around with the palm trees and stuff. like. But it, I, I know how good it looks from the outside. It's just a fabulous looking car. It just is so, so achingly pretty. Uh, I'm almost jealous of the people who get to see it drive by. I can't tell you the last time I saw an E34 just driving around. And to see one that is this nice looking and this color, uh, even if you don't realize how special it is, like it's a special thing to see one out and about at all in anything resembling nice condition. Personally, I wish I had room in the garage for this myself. I think this car is so cool, and I would love to flex on all of my friends that I have one of, na of, of 32 BMW M540i's ever made. You know, granted, the M badge on the back looks aftermarket, but it's not. It's like it's it's so it's legit if you know. Uh, and I think that's the E34 M540i's calling card. This is such an if you know you know car. You have to be a real BMW nerd to love this one. And that is the BMW E34 M540i and four other BMWs that you may have forgotten about. BMW makes a lot of wonderfully cool cars, and although they make a lot of Lee specials today, there is a period of time when they made truly unusual and very special cars. And if you love BMWs like I do, well, you can check out our wide selection on carsandbids.com. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will talk to you very soon. Goodbye.